Well, Privyet, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, comrades of all ages, my name is Dogbot33, and welcome back to our turn for the new world last year's Europe as the United Soviet Federation. Last video, the announcement hit us about the incoming resignation of, what's his name, Igor Kurchatov. And with that in mind, we are now moving to try to secure our position as Nikolai Kordashev. So in the last video, we secured the Central Records Commissariat. Knocked that out of the way. We might leave right now we're working on the Science Commissariat. Hopefully that'll work out well. And for now, we're going to get working on the rocket equation. Our journey to the endless stars is impeded by the technical challenges of reaching orbit. Even though regressive Germans and decadent Americans, capitalists have made in space, it was outstripped their success with less time. Therefore, we must gather every air, space, academic, and engineer we can and spur the nation on to the ultimate goal of a spacefaring civilization. Professor Oleg Cherkasov shifted uncomfortably in his seat as he glanced around the auditorium. There were only 30 or so men in the room, but they were amongst the finest nuclear engineers in the Soviet Federation. Abram and Artyom Alikensin, Oleg Fersov, Yuli Karaton, and Yakov Zeldovic, all brilliant physicists or former members of the Soviet Union's aborted atomic pro bomb project during the early stages of Great Patriotic War. Cherkasov felt almost an imposter sitting in the same room as these men, despite his own credentials and experience as a researcher. The mood was tense, and there was little talk among the physicists as they wa waited. They all knew what this gathering meant. Zidanov waited for the bomb, wanted the bomb. They were the men who had been chosen to build it for him. The idea felt Cherkasov with a mix of excitement and dread. Participating in a project of this importance would be a lifetime opportunity for Cherkasov, but the prospect of what the paramount leader of the Soviet Federation would do when he finally got the bomb terrified him. Just as was fought across his mind, the man himself entered the room, dressed in an all-white tunic and suit, supporting his characteristic thin mustache. Cherkasov could not help but feel like Zanov looked ridiculous. Yet, as the paramount leader climbed the steps to the state form, Cherkasov clamped, clapped emphatically as the other man... As all the other men of science and reason reaching his podium, Zidanov called for the crowds to quiet before he began to speak. Comrades, I will be quick and to the point. I have gathered you all here today to address an issue which is of fundamental importance to the Soviet Federation. As you all know, the diabolical Nazi thugs across to our west possess a nuclear arsenal capable of destroying us at a moment's notice. We are to ever defeat the Hitlerite dogs, the Soviet w workers must be armed with a nuclear arsenal of their own a worker's bomb to blow the Germans away. That is your mission. Working together with all the sources of our great Soviet motherland made available to you, you must, with great haste and energy, construct the worker's bomb. Comrades, you are being entrusted with the fate of ultra-visionary socialism. Do not fail me. Cherkasov and the other bomb makers rose, clapped, and shouted, Long live Zidanov. Well, there we go. Trying to see what might happen after the fact. The Science Commissariat is aligned with Chilamai now. Hopefully we can do something that will change that coming up. Iraq collapsed into civil war again? Who'd have thunk it? Oh god. Um, something happened over here. No, they're still... It goes with oil crisis, black gold, red sand. Uh oh, Ceres at war with them. Zimbabwe with Botswana. Let's do Poyakali. The resources have been, are marshaled, design bureaus have been prepared, and our first rocket is well upon its way to being constructed. This will serve two valuable purposes. First, development of rocket technology will allow us to project power and ensure the primacy of a superculture with nuclear weapons. Second, the development of spaceflight technology shall bring us ever closer to the stars and the ultimate progress of ultra-visionary socialism. 
Stars will be ours. Valentin Glukshow spent hours making sure he was ready. He slicked back his hair with that gel he got for his anniversary three times, drank so much coffee that his eyes darted around nervously, and made sure that his suit was completely free of creases. He checked the suitcase twice to make sure he had the necess necessary documents, and ran a lint roll across his fedora. His dog's hair wasn't going to be the one to ruin the big day. Valentin entered the office, exchanged pleasant shoes with Vladimir Chilamai, and sat down out at his desk, pretending to do work until the office went silent. Zadov must be here. What would he say? This was a crackpot, op crackpot operation, not some grand thing. Would he really be given... give them the money to build a rocket? It would be life-changing, finally getting out of the office, doing something... building something. His thoughts were interrupted by Vladimir Chilamoy walking to the office and motioning to Valentina to hurry up and talk to Zadov. Valentin got up, feeling like he was going to vomit. This was it. He saw Zidanov. He never thought it would be so intimidating. My good friend, Valentin. Is it? The smile on Zidanov's face was so wide, Valentin couldn't help but ease up. That was a real, authentic smile, right? Yes, that's me. So glad you can make it, Valentin. We have plenty to discuss, but I'll cut right to the chase. I want you to build a rocket, put a man in it, and take socialism to the rest of the universe. Of course, you'll be provided with as much fun as you need. Consider it a blank check. Valentin's mouth's out of gape. He must be choking. It, it was a funny joke, he had to admit. Perhaps a strange one, a little surreal, but... Unless your silence means you prefer not to? He wasn't joking. Zinov must be mad. No, no comrade, I, w I would love to. It would be my pleasure. Glad to hear, comrade Valentin. Now, would you like some vodka? What a strange proposal, thought Valentin. We're about to get in the, uh, the red, or the green, political power-wise, just so we can probably go back into the red. What do we want next? Finance, I think the industry, I think we already did industry, didn't we? Science comes already, it's just outright aligned. Let's go with the foreign commissariat. Can we? Is there anything there for it? Who do we try to undermine here? Hmm. Let's... I wonder if you're aligned, if there's just no meddling with them. We could just try to approach the Paramount leader. Maybe let's do... Let's speech see, uh let's seek out special circumstances. Kardashev halted at the door of Alexander Shermetiev, People's Commissar of Industry. According to his watch, he'd arrived five minutes before he was meant to, having called ahead to tell the commissar they would be coming by, by at four. Shrugging a little though a little war does lack of punctuality would cause him to catch a commissar off guard, he knocked on the door. Sharavityev's voice could be heard through the wood beckoning Kardashev to come in. Entering the office, Kardashev saw the commissar sitting at a mound of paperwork stacked on his desk. The two men greeted each other, friendly but curt, before Kardashev got down to business. I know he must be busy, but I have some ideas I think you might want to look into. Ideas, he said. 
Yes, I've been doing research and some thinking, and I think I have an idea of how we could vastly increase productivity in the industry sector. Provided I make Vice Premier. Really now? Could you explain some of it to me? Sure! And here, I've written down some projections as well. Kardashev added, placing down yet another stack of papers. Kardashev then sat down, going through his plans, ideas, and promises while the Commissar frankly took notes. When all was said was done, Kardashev took down. Thank you for your meeting with me today. I hope I can count on your support for my efforts towards becoming Vice Premier. I'll have to look over your work, but I'm sure it'll check out. I'll save here. Assuming the more political power you use up, the more likely that it is that you get it, the more likely it is that they align with you. I'm not entirely sure how it works. I'll save, and I'll see if that ends up being the case or not. The evening was cold, quiet and cold, and the wind j howling through the trees outside Kardashev's home. Just finished proofreading yet another research paper he'd been laboring over for a few days when he heard his phone ringing. Sauntering out across the house to the kitchen, Kardashev picked up the phone. On the other end was the familiar voice of Shermatev. Good evening, comrade. Evening. I looked over your notes and the ones I took during our conversation with a few of my analysts. I admit... At first, I was skeptical of how far-reaching and optimistic your ideas were, but they seem both achievable and efficient. Well, if you're in a position of Vice Premier, I'm positive we can make a change for the better in this country's industry. Ah, oh, that's great news. Thank you, comrade. Of course, of course. Honestly, it's something I appreciate, and you provided me, proved to me that you can reach for the stars and goddamn deliver. I look forward to your reign as Vice Premier if you make it there. Good night. Good night, comrade. So that works well. Finance is aligned with us. I'm curious what the opposition is going to do. I'm thinking we're going to want to start. Foreign Commissary is now aligned. That's not the best. Could be worst. I'm thinking. The Paramount leader was grumpy with excitement. Carter sat out of the window, binoculars ready. Glucho and Chilamoy had set aside their petty disputes for the day, not wanting to stand alone at the downside on this day of all days. Three, two, one. A column of smoke erupted from the platform, and the mighty engines of the great metal beast roared to life, and it sailed upon the column into the crystal blue sky. And Zdenov wondered, as he had on many sleepless nights, what awaited the species freed from the chains of gravity, free to roam the galaxy. How long would it be before the first meeting of the fellow cosmic travelers? When they told him the rocket had made a successful orbital insertion, Zidanov did not reply. His eyes were turned skywards, his smile wide, lost in the dreams of distant stars. From the present to the stellar future. We have a short-range ballistic missile, now available to develop. Nice. Let's get social sphere permeation. It's not enough to extol the virtues of superculture as a concept. We must make sure that every citizen is made aware of our goals at an unconscious level, that every aspect of our society is immersed in the values of ultra-visionary socialism. So the form commissariat seems to just be aligned with Chilamai. So I'm thinking we need to do something to undermine Chilamai's support right now. Or after this, I should say. Social sphere permeation. Pyotr shivered up in his bed. Master Khrushchev and met Ne mentioned never to stay up on Thursdays, but what did he know? The master was never ke never kept his word to increase the soup rations. In any case, he was on a mission. Young Mikhail had disappeared precisely two weeks to the day. Piotr wondered if he'd been adopted by someone. If the master didn't tell him what was up, he'd find out himself. 
Been ten minutes since the last adult entered. By Piotr's reckoning, this was the time when the adults gathered. He began to move, barely ever touching the ground with his feet. Bound by a silent bound, he covered his yacht space to the main lobby, where he'd heard the adults gather. His eyes grew wide as he approached the window. The harsh industrial lights were on, and he heard urging and talking from beyond the paint in glass. I mean, perhaps? Leaning in, he heard the muffled words. We'll compensate you for human losses. Crew show up. He must be mad. Two weeks from the last retrieval, he must take another child? What on earth are you doing to them? The master's voice had something different in it. It sounded really almost pained. I've seen morning. We are building the revolution. Young children, too, must serve a skull. Now, please step aside. I do not want to make this messy. Oh. And they are all illiterate, are they not? Very well. We will teach them words and, and marks. The door swung open, catching Piotr on the floodlights of a yard. A thick waisted man with a false smile leaned down towards him. His eyes gleaming like the magpies they often saw in the yard. Hello, little boy. How would you like to serve a socialist paradise? Piotr, tongue tied, only stared. In an instant, the man's gaze turned towards the coldness and uh, uh, nodded in the darkness outside. Take this one. We'll train him to agree to. As black gloved hands dragged him away from the factory, Piotr heard the sounds of his own cries, like the faint sobbing of the master, echoing in the expanse of a lobby like a bird's call. Now the child sent to greater purpose. Let's get uranium extraction techniques. Seems a little boring, not worth paying attention to too much. Nikolai Kodesh had no clue where the director of the investigation of special circumstances was, and apparently not to anyone else. No matter who he asked, there didn't seem to be an answer. Rather, a straight answer. I'm pretty sure it's in... One of those buildings? Nade pointed to the map as Nikolai blinked, before nodding as he made his way through and around him. The director of Agriculture? No. Perhaps if you tried the People's Commons Art of a Quag Transport? No. I don't know who told you to look here, but perhaps... Down more streets he walked, got more and more dismissals, direction that led nowhere before a single flick of, of hope. A matte cla black clad woman in a leather coat stood at the corner with a cigarette in her mouth. A small accessory to their ap apathetic stares as they approached, observed his approach. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm looking for the director of the, for the investigation of special circumstances. I would like to meet with Vladimir Simichansky to discuss. Special circumstances? Special circumstances for what? What kind of special circumstances are we in, comrade? She asked, tone inquisitive, even as her spa facial expression refused to change. No, I'm sorry. Thank you for your time. Did we just waste our time? Let's approach the Soviet army. Let's give that a shot. So the first thing, the first thing on Nikolai Kardashev's mind when he found the note on his desk was that he recalled locking the door. In fact, he specifically remembered locking it before leaving it, and yet nothing was missing. Nothing had been overturned or removed or destroyed. All that was different was a single note on his desk with a badge, complete with a hexagonal sword and orbit emblem that he knew as connected to special circumstances. And he had recalled locking the door. That wasn't in there before he left. Had they broken in, dispositive note and broken out? More importantly, the note. To people's commissar Nikolai Kardashev, you have my support, and your persistence is an admirable quality. We'll likely see each other in the future. Vladimir Semichansky. Any of the other individuals outside of the office likely noted a small output of excitement, followed by a large sigh of relief. Far better news than he expected. Okay, we got the intelligence service on board. We're doing really the best we can right now at this point. Kardashev had not been looking forward to this moment, when he knew it would be coming since his election as People's Commissar of Energy. The Federation Space Program had begun under the aegis of both the Commissariat for Energy and the Commissariat for Defense. As such, he would be expected to work with, closely, Vladimir Chilomey. Already, as expected, Chilomey had now begun spoken about how financial resources could be pooled, how scientists could be reassigned, 
and of how many he b believed that they could bring major projects, ones with direct act military functionality to fruition. At that, Kardashev had fought back. He wanted to see careful progress made in fundamental advances before any end-stage initiatives could be realized. He wanted economic, scientific, and civil uses given priority. But look Chilamai had given him when he mentioned such uses was withering. But Kardashev would not back down. He was no longer just another scientist. He was a commissar just like Chilamai was. And he would make sure his voice was heard. He would work hard, as hard as possible, to ensure that the programs could work sustainably to advance physical as a social science, regardless of what Chalamet said. Kardashev suppressed a sigh, an action he knew would be repeated many times in the day to come. Why, he thought, had not organized a program in such a way. As a venture between two major organs, I cannot help but have conflicting priorities. He could not find a satisfactory answer. The struggle began. Let's see. Spaceboard is leaning his way. 50 subjects were transferred to a new facility at Redacted from Gulag X. The facility consisted of a large compound made of glass walls, strong and transparent, totaling 30 rooms, a central meeting area, six bathrooms, a gymnasium, and a library. The set itself is minimalistic. There's no furniture higher than four feet. The library has no bookshelves. The gymnasium only includes a running track and lifting stations. The subjects were inspected to inhabit the compound for a four-month period, during which we were observed by our staff via hidden cameras and wiretappings. There's no interference on our part through the entire experiment. The subject had acquitted themselves well to the new environment. Results without privacy, the subjects resorted to in chronological order. Excessive conversations with one another and concerning trivial details, daily workouts, and reading of Marxist literature. During month two, or two, our staff noticed a trend among subjects. Thirty-two of them had formed a strong relationship with one another, confiding personal details and secrets, while the sociable ones continued with the routines described above. By the end of the final month, all but two of the subjects were highly sociable, partying in the main hall and engaging in various activities. Conclusion. We are able to gather critical data with the experiment. It appears that the human mind is indeed wired to the collective, reinforcing the findings of great social scientists. The mere fact that the subjects were willing to put aside privacy in favor of interaction and eventually develop trust is a great success. Unfortunately, our data is not yet complete. Further studies will need to be done to support the findings here. And there's the matter of the two individuals that had refrained from social interaction. They did not exhibit any abnormal behavior on release, so I wish to detain them for further questioning post test Remaining subjects have been transferred back to the Gulag system and placed within the same camp. Hoping the next batch will be more conclusive. At least no one went insane. Over simple, uh, diversified applications. Let's give it a shot. I'm trying to think how we're gonna... Proceed. Um, let's do military construction. It's probably a good idea. Let's keep working on moving towards that. I think we're just about done with most of these. We got I'll do one more for the Subliminal Immersion Initiative. Groups of involuntary subjects contained with the Gulag system shall be confined to a limited area, subjected to constant low-level white noise containing a set of subliminal phrases. All buildings and dormitories within the chosen camps shall be retrofitted to implement secure speaker systems within each building and around the camp perimeter. Inmate behavior shall closely be monitored during the time and conversations analyzed for trends pertaining to concepts associated with these phrases. Let's give it a shot. Let's head back up to this. What do we want to do next?
We might want to lock down the financial commissariat. Maybe. Yeah, let's try to lock them down. For Robert Karmashev sat down from Nikolai Oblisnin, he knew from the hard look in the general's eyes that he had war cut out for him. He needed to demonstrate the support from the military in order to advance his claim on the vice premiership. While he'd been told Oblisnin was naturally sympathetic to his viewpoints on political and economic matters, the general's not going to give him his endorsement for free. That would come with a cost. And so Kardashev spoke at length about his plans for the military. So should he be endorsed. He spoke of a more efficient intelligence apparatus, about increasing the military's efficiency in all matters, about the absolute necessity for the encouraging of an as an apolitical nature within the armed forces, and thereby ensuring state stability. Blissenden listened patiently, and Kardashev could tell he, in general, quite liked what he heard. But most, but, and most critically for any statement of support, he had not been yet how much effort and political capital Kardashev was willing to spend to achieve a transformation promise. And that decision would make all the difference. Let's promise him even more effort. Political power be damned. Kardashev had not realized he had been holding his breath until the moment Obisnin offered his response to entreaty a slight nod. It was as if a weight had been removed from his chest. As Obisnin began to speak, some of that weight returned, but not nearly as much as he feared when first sitting down. But the general was very clear he supported Kardashev's goals for the military establishment, and he was convinced that the promises would, at the very least, be fulfilled to the greatest extent possible. He would not, however, openly support Kardashev's candidacy. As he said, an apolitical military was a laudable and critical goal, and he cannot but exemplify be exemplified in the present. What he would do, however, was remain objectively neutral in a personal sense. He would also work to ensure the rest of his general staff behave similarly. Standing and shaking hands, Kardashev turned to leave. It was not all he had wanted, but as the general had said, exemplifying and thus proving the belief of apoliticality was important. In addition, at the very least, he thought he was not receiving endorsement from the military establishment. Neither was Shelmoy, and Kardashev decided that was good enough. The best outcome reasonably possible. They're leaning our way now. I'll take that. Let's get a socialist superculture. From the small built beginnings in Siktivkar, we've outmaneuvered our reactionary opponents and regressive allies at every turn. Russia was broken into pieces. And now, in the crucible of reunification, we shall forge a new superculture. To stand the test of time, none shall stand in the way of our ascendants. Not the capitalist decadence of the West, nor the oppressive fascists of Germany, nor the atavistic banditry of warlord years. Uniting our goals, we march forward in lockstep to the destination that only ultra-visionaries can perceive. For what is a single voice compared to a magnificent chorus? To be born, there was no darkness, no light, only a lack of perception. She was pulled through the cold, but serene nothingness by will. Neurons began to fire, and though... And through that thought, she reached towards consciousness. This reaction was not biological, but a consequence of a fiery determination to live and to thrive. Warmth exploded across her body as blood began to torrent through her veins and organs activated called life. Warts formed as though putty being thrown together and smashed. Pragmatic analysis and reasoning took helm, and with their arrival, she was once again lucid. She opened her eyes. A digital light pierced her vision. The monitor of a computing machine, completely blank, with the exception of a cursor dot in the center on the screen. All else besides a monitor was blurry. Shadows moved around about the background, and flashes of light at points broke through the radical radial blur. Her limbs sat unmoving. Her fingers wriggled with pulses of her muscles, but she was otherwise paralyzed. A sharp t tone rang out. Please attempt to move the cursor. Then epiphany hit. Her other eye, and a large section of her brain, was no longer a part of her body. In their place, there was only the churning machinery and the clatter chattering of metal. Well, at first, panic, and then descendant the inferno. The points at which her brain tissue contacted the machinery burst, burnt with fire, blood. Fire, blood, and fire. The pain of a little body pounced upon her mind all at once. She sat. Staring towards the monitor, bearing unimaginable suffering and unable to express her agony. There was no life here. Reality entered it, and with it she retreated. She closed her eyes. The serenity of nothing would be her haven in place of hell. The light did not fade. It progressed. Where there is a will, we are the way.
that didn't work. Soviet army is impartial, which I'll take. Spaceboard program could lean more in our direction, admittedly. What else from here? Maybe recon companies would be good. Let's get recon companies. Iraq has been defeated by Iraq. Let's get the ultimate weapon going. What's every great power in today's world have in common? The ability to deliver a nuclear payload to any point on the planet. We must deliver the same capabilities if we are to expand the supercultures to the rest of the world. Show the world that Russia has rebounded to surpass its greatest heights. Kardashev had been both a scientist all his life, or at least once he'd been permitted to be one. So when the Federation announced the creation of the ambitious space program, he had supported it and become involved wholeheartedly. He was not sure if that was still the case. The cataclysm for this event was the lunch he had had just left with Vladimir Chelemai, one of the primary architects of the program as a whole. The man was undoubtedly a genius in whom Kardashev had long idolized. He was also, as Kardashev now knew, a man whose ideals were actively dangerous, not only to the space program, but to the Federation as a whole. While Kardashev had opposed reasonable exploration, the leveraging of serial gravity environments for his research, and the general program of safety and sustainability, Chelemai had almost immediately dismissed it. He and the Paramount leader as well wanted nothing but the most ambitious projects possible. Enormous capsules and stations, heavy lift rockets, using the most dangerous and unsuitable of fuel mixtures, military applications. Not only was such a course indefinitely reckless, Kardashev knew, but it was also wholly unsustainable in terms of resources, human, financial, and otherwise. And so Kardashev thought upon reflection, what was he to do about it? Who would, he, who would listen to him or support him, if any objection to what he made? He knew he had to find someone who would, somebody with influence, someone who would help before it was too late. Impossible ideals? Finance Karmazariat. This would push us over the edge. If we can lock it down. Would it? People's commissary to finance was a surprisingly long walk from Kardashev's office, and while the building that had ultra-visionary flair was not nearly as bombastic or as eye-catching as all the other government buildings that Kardashev had visited, eventually Kardashev was able to find Dmitri Shepilov's small office, the door squeaking as he entered the room. <sighs> you want me to support you as vice premier? Yes, comrade, I do. I understand our current policies and budgets. What budgets? Every half-baked madman is given a blank check without so much as a glance towards my office. Kardashev paused to allow Sheplov to calm down before continuing. Yes, comrade, I'm fully aware. Promise to you that I will also evaluate the situation regarding our... Just don't, comrade. Don't mention the debt. For my sanity's sake, please. Understood. I hope you can see me as most more pragmatic and reasonable candidate and... Fine! You have my support! I hope you don't make me regret this decision. Thank you, comrade. I shall do my best. It is very close. I think one we contact the old reformers. And then I'll give it a few days. We might be able to lock it down anyway, but I want to give a shot one at the Science Commissariat, and one at the Paramount Leader. You know, we'll, we'll do all of these, why not? Fuck. No, no, that was right, that was right. Also, I, I forget if I pointed this out, but if I didn't... These guys are still at war. That's interesting. 
The banner of London is over us. We've come to build happiness. With the young hands, we write the biography of the earth. Glory to the ones who look forward. Glory to the ones who march forward. Our path is from the present to the stellar future. Our path is from the present to the coming years. Youths like a stellar rocket ascend upward every day. We shall light clear dawns above the motherland. Let's see who the opposition appeals to. Recon companies. 80, who'd they get? I don't even know if they got anyone. Look towards the old formers. Glory to the ones who look forward. Let's get some stuff in Perm going. And some stuff in Sictive Car. The evening had been pleasant. But the talks light and enjoyable. Kardashev and his friend Yuri had enjoyed several glasses of wine the comfort of Kardashev's home. Now, as the night was winding down, the conversations took a more serious turn. Kardashev was careful how he inserted his question. Yuri, don't you think you have to answer? Don't think you have to answer. I merely want you to know. Yes? Asked Yuri, taking a sip of his wine and letting the liquid burn pleasantly on his tongue. What are you about to say? Well, my friend, if you know of any, shall we say, persecuted elements, tell them that they have a friend in Kardashev. Kardashev wasn't a brilliant wordsmith. His delivery awkward, his tone clear, but it worked its intended effect upon Yuri. <laughs> yes, of course! <sighs> Clear excitement on his face. He beams, subtly eased. My friend, I'll be sure to pass along the messages. Regrettably looking at time, I'm afraid I must take my leave. Yuri exited hastily, patting Kardashev on the back and sh shut the door behind him. Kardashev smiled, the pieces were falling in place. Thank God that worked. Kardashev glanced up from his work as he heard the footsteps of the mail carrier on his front desk. Placing down his pencil and listening as his steps faded, he slowly rose to his feet and left his study. Approaching the front door, he bent down to pick up an envelope that had dropped through his mail slot. Strangely, it lacked a return address or a stamp. Sliding the latch on his door, he peered out in the street and saw no signs of a postal worker. The letter had been developed by, delivered by hand. Opening the envelope, he began to read, Dear Mr. Kardashev, do not know who I am, and I would like to be kept that way, as my position in this country is tenuous. I have been fought every step of my career by the establishment under your colleagues, but I find myself thanking you. I've been informed that you and others loyal to you are sympathetic to the plight of people like me, and thus I'm humbly thanking you for your work and hope you continue to do so in the future. Thank you, Mr. Kardashev. You can count on my support in whatever capacity I and others can offer, like me can offer it. Sincerely, a new friend. A subtle smile crossed Fizz's face as he finished reading the anonymous letter. Happily and a good bit prideful, he stood back up straight and went to make sure the letter was disposed of for the sake of his new friend. What a nice fellow. Oh, we are so close! Kardashev had set up his projector and slides just so. Eagerly awaiting the arrival of Zidanov, he felt like a schoolboy again, ready to give his presentation to, on sea otters to the class. The eyes of a schoolmaster boring into the side of his head. But Zidanov was not his wire-old schoolmaster. No, Zidanov was far more important, the stick of disappointing him far wider. It was almost a relief when Zidanov entered the room, a polite smile flashing across his white face before he took a seat. Please, Comrade Kardashev, you may begin. Kardashev nodded, sweat forming on his brow from the heat of projector and his own nerves. While I'm most pleased to present you, or my Kardashev, as a potential for a fusion-based fuel economy. Petroleum will, as we know, run dry. If we are looking toward the future, towards the stars, we need an unlimited source of fuel. Zenov nodded, silently urging Kardashev to continue. The answer is fusion. With proper materials, we 
it could provide unlimited energy for Soviet Federation for our space program. So you don't have to hold up a long hand. You're speaking of a long, God, long-term project. The infrastructure alone would take years to establish Kardashev. This is assuming it could be pulled off. Kardashev cleared his throat, nervously contemplating his next words. A great deal hinge on what he said next. Promise the world. Fusion is the best way to the future. The... Okay. Next, we meet, meet with Keladish. Kardashev was surprised he'd been handed a letter by his secretary. Apparently, Comrade Keladish had decided to... Re surprised? Comrade decided to respond at all. Once Kardashev was left alone in his office, he opened the envelope and began reading the letter. He hoped it was good news. Comrade Kardashev, been thinking over our previous conversation, I've had to rewrite the letter multiple times to truly put my thoughts into words. I've become infatuated with some of the ideas we discussed, and I think there are some brilliant ideas that we must explore further. I had some of my scientists look into nuclear fusion, and it looks like... Kardashev was surprised to see how long the letter was, and quickly skimmed over to see what Kelly Dish had said about Kardashev's bid for Vice Premier. After scanning both sides of the first piece, Aper, Kardashev moved on to second. With the guards have him out of Kurchatov's retirement. I think would he, he would be an excellent choice for his successor. You have my support. The People's Commissary of Science had crammed two sentences at the bottom of the page, with no room left for a signature. Kardashev thought that was a good sign. Remember the people. Fusion, genetic engineering. That's the science we need. Kardashev stood above the man of the board for the intersolar activities presidium for intersolar activities excuse me i'm getting nervous we're we're uh oh, oh where did it go it's down here okay this podium overlooking the entire board Comrades of the board, thank you for inviting me. As you know, my goal is to become the next vice premier. It's still ongoing. I need as much support in the presidium as I can get, which you can provide to me. <sighs> now, my proposal for a better space program are much different than some of the other presidiums. I know many who have promised the militarization of space and millions of other things, many unachievable. Instead of a militarized space program, I propose a more peaceful one. One where we explore the stars, not to conquer in the name of socialism, but to learn, to improve our own self. To be honest, it will be a challenge, but one we can overcome, and not impossible. Kardashev paused, seeing what the responses from the board were, and continued. I also propose a peaceful answer to ensure we gain resources from the stars, space industrialization. Instead of militarizing space, we must use it to our advantage, unending resources in our hands. Our only our supremacy of technology bringing us forward. Without competition from imperialists, we will rise. Ending his speech, Kardashev anticipated the board's reaction. The chairman was beginning to look interested. I like where your ideas are coming from, Kardashev, but the industrialization of space sounds like a difficult task. What can you promise to make it all worth the effort that must be put into it? Full funding for an industrialized solar system. We are so close. Kardashev was surprised to be handed a letter by his secretary. Apparently, Keladish had decided to sprout after all. Car Once Kardashev was alone in his office, he opened the envelope and began reading the letter. He hoped it was good news. Comrade Kardashev, been thinking over our previous conversation, I've had to rewrite this letter multiple times to truly really put my thoughts into words. I've become infatuated with, with some of the ideas we've discussed. Let's see, da da da. Oh, this is the same thing. There we go. Ending with his promise, Kardashev saw all the chairman smile. That sounds perfect, Comrade Kardashev. The chairman sat, said, as the rest of the board began to clap. Your speech has been very persuasive. I believe you have our endorsement. Your endorsement. <laughs> Thank you. And I promise I will do all I can as your vice premier. On that note, Kardashev stepped off the podium as the board began their official vote to extend the endorsement to him looking as if it were unanimous. Grabbing a glass of water, Kardashev reflected to himself. Would he be able to get the board what they wanted? The Federation is already short on funds after years of war and development, and would only get worse. But then again, Zidanov had always been confident during the speeches he had given. As his vice premier, he would make sure that the Federation achieved what every person in Russia dreamed of, no matter the cost. A true socialist civilization was coming, and it wouldn't stop until it hit the very edges of the galaxy. Another step to vice premiership. A sigh of relief whistled 
quietly from beyond Kardashev's teeth, like a warm breeze through a valley. The piece of paper he held in his hand may as well have been his stay of execution, at least on a political scale. Gardship sat in his chair, reading it again and again, ease settling into the pit of his stomach a little more each time he scanned over lines. Comrade Kardashev, rest assured that I have complete confidence in whatever candidate the presidium chooses in regards to your fusion project. Do not concern yourself over much with matters of the state. But know your project will come to rest in capable hands. Regardless, regards, Sidonov. Peace of mind, thought Kardashev. That's what the letter represented. Now with some luck, his project could move forward. The United Soviet Federation is creeping just a little closer to the stars. We'll soon be escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space. And with that, we got it, boys. And with that, I'm going to have to cut it here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you as always for watching. I hope you liked this video. Leave a like. If not, feel free to dislike. And we'll see more of this content feature. Hit the sub button. More about every weekday as well as occasionally Saturdays. If you have any comments, feedback, concern, anything sort, leave in the comments section below. I read all the comments I get and appreciate any all feedback you might have for me. If you want to chat, play games, anything of the sort, check out my Discord. If you want to send back some every month, I have a Patreon. If you want to see me do a surf live, I have a Twitch. All for the channel description box below. That's it for now. Thank you as always for watching. My name has been Dogbot333, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.